Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, I overheard someone say that they grew up with Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, and Bob Hope. And now there's no Jobs, no Cash, and no Hope. Please, Lord, don't let anything happen to Kevin Bacon. The title I've chosen this morning is Into Dust. And I know you might automatically think of the verse that says, For dust you are, and to dust you will return. But I promise you, this message is not as depressing as you might think it is. So, if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me, I'd like to open with a prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, we come to you this morning praying for your peace, peace of mind and peace of heart. Please help us leave behind the distractions and troubles of the week so we will hear the words that you would have us hear. And please be with me as I share the message that you would have me share. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I'm not going to ease into it. I'm just going to hit the ground running and say that do you know it's a miracle that you were born? And I mean physically born. It's a miracle that you're alive at this time, in this generation, in this skin, with that hair texture, and in that gender. You were divinely planned by God and made exactly who you were intended to be for the purposes of the kingdom. Even before the foundation of the world, God had you planned for this generation. We didn't come through 2020 and 2021 and seven months of 2022 by accident. We were assigned for this. We were planned to rise up in the spirit and power of God right now, in these bodies, in our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces, and in this church. Have you ever wondered why it took God six days to create the world, but nine months to create you? You matter. You have purpose and you have worth. Bob Goff said you're here and I'm here because God decided to have us intersect history not just any time, but at this time. He made us to be good at a few things and bad at a couple others. He made us to love some things and not like others. Most of all, he made us to dream. We were meant to dream, a lot. We're not just some cosmic biology experiment that ended up working. We're part of God's much bigger plan for the whole world. And after Jesus arrived, God whispered to all of humanity, it's your move. Ever since you got here, heaven is waiting to see what you'll do with your life. So how's life going for you right now? Some of you may be walking through a dark time in life, and I get that. You may be walking through the valley and thinking, that miracle didn't happen for me. A lot of us know the promises of God out of the Bible, but somehow we don't believe them to be true in our own personal lives. So, can I ask you, do you believe that God can do something in your life right now? There's a poem I'll share in full with you later on, but for now I want to take just one line out of context. It's actually a question, and the question is this. Do you not know what the Holy One can do with dust. Let me repeat that. 
Do you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? But wait, what is dust? Isn't dust just this worthless dry powder? Isn't it that annoying film that covers every surface of our home, even though we just cleaned? Dust is just a nuisance, right? So what exactly can the Holy One do with dust? We've all seen those superhero movies, right? Where the hero has a secret dual identity. Clark Kent is Superman. Bruce Wayne is Batman. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. The list goes on and on. And if you think about it, you and I have a dual identity as well. But our identity isn't a secret. It's plainly revealed in Genesis 2 verses 7, which says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So the earth is not only the place in which we work, it's also a part of us. We belong to the earth. We were made of dust. But thankfully, that's not the whole story. The rest of that verse says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God breathed into the man not just any old air, but his very own breath, the breath of life. So our dual identity is that we are a combination of dust and God's breath. We are both natural and, in a sense, supernatural. In the Bible, dust actually signified many other things as well. For example, dust could be used to mean the grave, or man's frailty, or man's mortality. Casting dust on the head could be a sign of mourning. Throwing dust at someone was a sign of disgust. And sitting in the dust was a sign of extreme affliction, deep humiliation, and depression. Let's take Job, for instance. He literally fell to the dust of the ground. He lost everything, his children, his possessions, his health, and finally, he just couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't hold himself up against the gravity of the earth. And with the weight of the world on his shoulders, he just collapsed. And maybe you felt that same way too at times. We receive bad news and all the blood rushes out. Our limbs get numb and we just collapse. It reminds us that we're human, and even though we're God's creation, we are dingy and dusty, and often in need of cleansing. So what did Job do after he fell to the ground? Job fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He fell to the ground in despair and desolation, but then he worshipped. Are we at that level of close communion with God where we can still worship his name, even in the dust? Now, on the flip side, what do you think God does while we are entering the pain? What does he do while we are in the storm? And I think you'll love the answer to this. He prays for us. Because Jesus lives forever, he won't ever stop serving as priest. He is able always to save those who come to God through him because he always lives, asking God 
to help them. He is too wise to forget you, too loving to hurt you. When you can't see him, trust him. He is praying a prayer that he himself will answer. Elijah is known as the prophet who wanted to die. When his burden seemed too great to carry, like so many other great leaders, he actually prayed that he would die. Moses also asked God to take his life. Jonah would have rather died than see the Ninevites repent and be spared by God. And Jeremiah cursed the day of his birth. These were all great men of God, yet even at their greatest, they were still men. Elijah 19 verses 4 to 6 says he went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. When Elijah became depressed and discouraged, he sought release from his troubles through death. But God didn't answer his prayer and instead provided him with food and rest. Maybe that's a gentle reminder to us as well, that sometimes all we might need is maybe a nap and a good meal too. I want us to take a look at three reasons why God chose not to answer Elijah's prayer. It may just help us understand why God sometimes may not answer our prayers in the way we think is best, too. Number one, God looked behind Elijah. God takes our human nature into account when considering our requests. Elijah was spiritually, physically, and emotionally drained. And in this mental state, we often say things that we don't really mean as well. But the Lord knew that Elijah's request was motivated by his exhaustion, not by a genuine desire to die. So instead, God gave him what he really needed, and he sent an angel to minister to his needs, providing him with food and water. Number two, God looked within Elijah. He saw that Elijah's real problem was that his heart was filled with unbelief, impatience, pride, and self-pity. He saw that Elijah was walking by sight, not by faith. And instead of trusting God, Elijah ran ahead of him rather than waiting for the Lord to reveal his will to him. Have you ever tried to take control of a situation because of impatience or unbelief? I sure have. And number three, God looked beyond Elijah. God had some very special things in store for Elijah. If he had allowed him to die, Elijah would have missed God's wonderful plan for his life. In fact, the Lord had planned that Elijah would never die, but instead a chariot of fire would appear and take Elijah up to heaven. If God had answered Elijah's prayer, he would have died a defeated man. But instead, the Lord told Elijah, Don't give up. I have something even better planned for you. Trust me and I will give you glory and honor. God knows what we have been through in the past 
and what lies ahead of us in the future. He knows what is best for us, and he may have something even better planned for you than you would even dream of asking. If you're a gardener, you know that repositioning a fruitless branch will give it more sun and more space. And it's the same with God. Before God cuts a fruitless branch, he lifts it up. You've seen gardeners realign a plant, and you've probably seen God realign a life. The family that was uprooted and transferred to another city, was it so they could learn to trust God? The person so healthy, suddenly sick, was it to remind him to rely on the gardener? The income stream dried up. Was it God's way of lifting you out of the soil of self and drawing you closer to him? Leaders with questionable motives and morals are elected. Is it God's way of stirring people to revival? God does everything just right and on time. But people can never completely understand what he is doing. God is up to something. He is the busy, active gardener who clears the field and removes the stones. He inspects the plants and pulls the weeds. And most of all, he is good. He is the good gardener who cares for his vine. Here's what I love about trusting and resting in God. It means God is saying, take your hands off the situation. And when you take your hands off the situation, that's when God can put his hands on the situation and show us the miracle and power of God. God may even tell us to sit down in order to show us a miracle. Because this battle is not ours. There's two powerful little words that I'm sure we've all been ensnared by. What if? Now I know and you know that those two words are all it takes for the enemy to get our imagination going. But I have two different words fighting words for you to respond with. Because if we're going to defeat the what ifs, our answer should be because God. Because God clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the birds of the air, we don't need to be anxious about tomorrow. Because God poured his love into our hearts, our hope will not be put to shame. Because God chose us to be saved by his strength, we can stand firm in our faith, no matter what the day holds. Every single thing in this world was created. The animals, the land, the sea. But humans, we were formed. Formed not just in any image, but in God's image which means we have the capacity that nothing else has. We are in this middle ground, below the creator, but above the creation. Think of it this way. We are like mirrors slanted at 45 degrees. God's love, glory, and likeness shine down on us, and like any slanted mirror should, we reflect that goodness and beauty out into the world. It works backwards, too. As image bearers, our job is to be gardeners, as Adam was before he ate the fruit. We are to take raw materials, make something creative and beautiful, and then offer that to God as worship. A gardener shapes, cultivates, plants, and ultimately brings value to something that before had no value. We are to take sounds of instruments and make music. To take vegetables and herbs 
and make a beautiful meal. To take paint and canvas and make art. Now, we all have wounds, whether it be physical or emotional. We all have things that make us physically cringe just thinking about them. If you touch a wound, people coil back because it's so sensitive and painful. What would someone have to touch in your life for you to react like that, to coil back, to cringe? What if God wants to heal that? What if God wants to turn your wounds into scars? And the interesting thing about scars is that we don't hide scars as we do wounds. Wounds we cover, we mask, we make sure no one can see them or touch them, but scars are the opposite. We aren't afraid to show our scars because it's not painful to tell their stories. Those who know me know that I have this scar on my elbow. And I wish I had an interesting story to tell about how I got that, but I just simply fell off my bike when I was five years old. Although I didn't get near enough the amount of attention that President Biden did when he fell off his bike, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> What if Jesus wants to take our wounds and turn them into scars? God has declared that when we follow him, we are new. We are clean, we are forgiven, and those are the truest things about us, not the voice of the wound. That wound is now a scar. It's been healed. And notice, too, that when Jesus comes out on the other side in the resurrection, his wounds are no longer wounds, but scars. They've been healed. They tell a story. Jesus, even in his perfect, glorified body, still has scars. Jesus says, look at my scars. He's saying that to us in our pain. He experienced death, but he also experienced the resurrection, which means that evil didn't win. You see, many of us see scars as a weakness. But if Jesus has scars after the resurrection, then maybe they're not a weakness. Maybe scars are what make us truly human. They show that we've lived. They tell our story. Without our scars, we might not be the same people, but praise God, they're no longer wounds. Even David, a man after God's own heart, had a roller coaster journey. Near the beginning of the Psalms, he said, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Now, the David that wrote that seems depressed and desperate, but we know that's not where his story ended. Because, as our scripture reading says, he raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap. Romans 8 verses 39 says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Had God not given us those promises, I would be a fool to share them with you today. But since he has, we would be fools not to believe it. You fill the world with food, but we blame you for hunger. You keep the earth from tilting and the arctics from thawing, but we accuse you of unconcern. You give us blue skies, and we demand rain. You give rain, 
and we demand sun. We give more applause to a ball carrier than to the God who made us. We sing more songs to the moon than to the God who saved us. We are a fly on the tail of one elephant in the galaxy of Africa's, and yet we demand that you find us a parking place when we ask. And if you don't give us what we want, we say you don't exist. We pollute the world you loan us. We mistreat the bodies you gave us. We ignore the word you sent us. And we killed the son you became. You have every reason to abandon us, but your love never ceases. Never. Though we ignore you and disobey you, nothing can diminish your love. Our goodness cannot increase it, and our faith does not earn it any more than our stupidity jeopardizes it. You don't love us less if we fail. You don't love us more if we succeed. Your love never ceases. I asked a question as we started this morning. Do you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? What can the Holy One do with our trials, our suffering, our pain? What can He do with us? As we near our closing, I'd like to read this poem for you called Blessing the Dust. And I hope it will console you but also challenge you. It goes like this. All those days you felt like dust, like dirt, as if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial. Did you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what has made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes, that makes its home inside the soil of this sacred earth. So let us be marked not for sorrow, and let us be marked not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made and the stars that blaze in our bones and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge we bear. And so, as we go about our day and our week, I want to leave you with this challenge. What blessing can we claim from the dust? We know what God can do with dust. He blesses the dust. He breathes life into the dust. He gives purpose and grace and meaning to the dust. He's with us in the dirt. He is the maker of your heart and the healer of your wounds. He's the savior of the world, but yet he carries the weight of all our hurt. He's the grace we don't deserve. And he speaks life into dust. It wasn't meant to be this way Broken beneath the grief and pain There's nothing left here But into my dust you poured your grace Lifted my head and 
spoke my name You'll see me through this You are the maker of my heart You are the God, you were here right from the start Holding its peace that broke apart And I'll trust you through this You are the maker of my heart You are the healer of my scars God, I will trust in To the dust you called my heart to rise with your breath in me. I am alive, I will trust in you. I will lift my hands to the skies and sing all my hope in you. The King of Kings, I will trust in you. God, I will trust in who you are. You are good. You speak life. You are the Savior of the world. But carry the weight of all my hurt. You are the grace I don't deserve. You are good. You speak life. Into dust Into dust I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are able to speak life into the dust. God, you are here right from the start. And as we go through this week, help us to trust you through whatever we're going through, knowing that your love never ceases. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.